Hello, hi. So, here goes volume two of my development log, and uh, I'm doing procedural sphere generation. Wow, sounds so fancy. Yeah. Okay, discussing spheres, shall we? Spheres, yeah, we're discussing spheres. Okay, so here I, I just showed you a couple of examples of what spheres can be like. So, here you can have a globe. Uh, we're not going to be using that because it's not efficient in point distribution. Here's the icosphere. Uh, which is nice, but the base mesh is 20 equilateral triangles and uh, making it more detailed and dividing it up uh, actually skyrockets the, the number of vertices too much. It's, it's, it's too exponential. Now here there is the geodesic octahedron, which is okay. There is eight uh, base equilateral triangles and I actually started working on this one, but it didn't fit into this video, so maybe the next. And the cubes here, which is basically a six side cube like all cubes, genius, and uh, being inflated and uh, so that every point on that cube is forced to be at the same distance from the center. This is going to be the topic of this video, and I'm going to be uh, showing you how to procedurally generate a sphere like so, using the cube sphere technique. We're also going to be applying some trigonomic functions like cos on the surface of that sphere to see how it deforms. Last time I uh, started off by previewing a little bit what the end result is going to look like, and then I... Uh, showed in complete detail how to get there, how to implement it. And then I went into uh, satisfying slash artistic, display the best uh, settings and best setups to make it look nice, uh, all the way at the end with music. Uh, so I thought I will swap it around this time and I will actually start by the satisfying part first and uh, uh, after it I'll be showing you exactly how to implement it. I hope you enjoy this and perhaps you want to do it yourself. Okay, so, so, so basically generating the spheres and applying different noises on them wasn't enough for you, yeah? You decide to make them thick, yeah? And make it like a tongue as well. Okay, yeah, okay, understandable. Understandable, sure. Uh, honestly, this one is my favorite. It's like like a, like a bed sheet opening up in front of you. Also reminds me of this for some reason, but I guess it makes sense. This is the part where I'm going to be describing you step by step what you need to do to get to a project where you can customize the settings and achieve what I was showing you in the last couple of minutes. The next minute of the video is going to be me adding basic elements like materials and blueprints to a project in order to set it up for actual coding. I'm not going to make you watch it in real time, so I will just list for you everything I did. Those parts are very basic and you should be able to cope with them yourself. Creating a new blank blueprint project and naming it. Saving the default map. Deleting viewport objects except sky sphere, skylight and player start. Creating empty game mode and pawn blueprints. Setting default map, default game mode, and default pawn in settings. Moving player start to look at the center. Creating one emissive blue material. Creating one empty blueprint actor for the sphere generation. Dragging that actor into the world. 
I'll guide you through the last part of the setup. We need one particular plugin, which is called a Runtime Mesh Component. All you need to do is type in Google Runtime Mesh Component UE5, and you should get a link to the GitHub depository. And we need to switch from the master branch to the Unreal Engine 5 branch. Perhaps when you watch the video, this branch will be the master. So, so make reference to which Unreal Engine version you're using. Uh, click download, unzip, and now all you need to do is to create uh, a folder called plugins in the uh, your new created project, just find it in your explorer, and paste that unzipped plugin into it. After that, close your project, restart it over, it will take a minute to compile, maybe more, after which you should get access to its capabilities. Now that we're ready, let's open that blueprint actor I asked you to create. I'll remove those functions for now. What you need to do is add two components to our scene. First is the runtime mesh and then the procedural mesh. And I'm not sure in which order they should be or which hierarchy, but I did it this way, uh, you figure it out. Here we're gonna define all the variables we will need for this project. Perhaps it's gonna be a little confusing to see them all together. So for each variable, I'll be explaining what it is used for. So the first will be vertices, an array of type vector. At the beginning of the cube generation, we're gonna have to store each face's uh, vertices and points somewhere and this is actually the array that will be doing that next one is vertices default the same type of array uh, now this is actually a kind of a safe place of all the vertices we created of the default positions because we're going to be applying placements onto the vertices later uh, we don't want to lose track of the initial default values of those vertices because if we let that slip we are going to end up building up and up 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 on top of the noise we need a place where we can know where those points were at the start, where they belong. Triangle is an array of integers. Even if we're working with squares, they're going to be divided into triangles, and that variable, and, and that array will be storing the order in which each triangle is connected. It can be connected in different order, and that order is important because it will define in which direction the face will be oriented towards. UVs array, which is going to be a vector 2D array, which is which we're not going to be messing much with, but is going to be uh, giving us ability to put materials on top of our uh, procedural mesh and see them as less than more distorted. Resolution, which is an integer. This variable will be defining how many times should a grid be divided into squares uh, to increase its resolution. For example, a value of 1 will mean that there's only one square, but a value of 2 will mean that each side will be divided by 2, giving us 4 squares. And so on and so on, it will give us more detail. Radius, which is a float, will be very useful to us to uh, scale the object up and down. Face rotations rotator array is used to rotate faces around the center to build a cube. So we're going to have six faces. So we're going to have to have six angles to add to our faces uh, to put them in the right spots. A vertex number per section, uh, which is uh, just an integer variable, which will store how many actually vertex vertices we have per face. The last two variables are floats, axis position, and axis speed are actually going to be used later on in the noise uh, functions. And since we want to have some sort of trigonomic cost uh, behavior of a surface, uh, we're going to be moving an axis up and down the object, all the way from its bottom, all the way to its top, and then back. Vertices on a sphere will change their displacements based on how proximate they are to that line. And uh, axis position will be storing the current position of that axis and speed will be actually the incremental uh, change of that axis. Now it should be easier for you to follow along. Uh, we will start working on our script in the construction section. We want to generate the whole mesh inside of the constructor so that it's all, always maintaining it. And uh, actually the changes we're going to be uh, making in the noise, we're going to be doing it in the event graph. Let's start creating our cube by creating one face. Let's use the create grid mesh welded function and the input for x and y is actually our resolution the breakdown of each side uh, make sure to change the spacing to one and this will give us pre-calculated vertices triangles and uvs so let's set uvs and triangles to our respective prepared arrays uh, but not the vertices yet we want to make one change to vertices we want to multiply it by the radius so we're going to cycle through the whole array multiply each value by the radius so that it's dependent on us and then add it to our versus storage and while we add it let's also add it to the versus default storage where we should be keeping the default values now we actually didn't create the grid yet we actually need to create it manually from the variables we worked out before we do that let's set the material of that particular section we're creating to blue and create mesh section 
uh, will create that grid for us. Uh, make sure that the index for the section is the same. And we will plug in the information that we have, the triangles, the UVs, and the vertices, and make sure that you apply both those functions to the procedural mesh. Now we can actually clear the vertex array because we don't have a use for them anymore. And also let's clear the default vertices uh, all the way at the start uh, so that it doesn't accumulate it over and over again when the constructor is called. Okay, let's have a look. Oh, our plane has appeared, very nice. Uh, I, I do have a 90 degrees angle here, but that's okay. So you, as you can see, resolution and radius work. So we can have a better look at that in the wireframe mode. As you can see, the resolution is increasing correctly and also the radius is affecting the grid correctly. Very good. Let's make a cube out of this now. So we need six faces and each face will have its particular rotation. As you remember, we have a face rotations array. Let's fill it now. Uh, we want to uh, differentiate the first four inputs by 90 degrees so that the face rotates around the center of the mesh by a quarter of the way and then the last two will rotate by 90 and 270 but on a different axis. That way we will actually have a full cube. Right, uh, to add this to our code, before we multiply by the radius we need to rotate that particular vector. We can use the rotate vector function. For now we will just grab the first uh, item, but in order to make this script work for six phases, we need to introduce another loop all the way at the start, right after we clear the vertices. Let's introduce a loop and we'll just put a, a fixed number five in it. Let's create a local variable index. Since I discovered we can do this, I do it all the time. It's so amazing. It saves you so much space and connections. It looks so much neater. So we'll set the index to that index and now we can use it as a variable in other places uh, in the set material and in the create mesh section. Each section will be a particular face. And now in our newly added face rotation. Okay, it's working, but we're not lacking the separation between them. And that will be the next thing to implement. After a little bit of experimentation, I realized if you make a vector with only a Z value and uh, add it to our script here, it will affect the distance that faces have from each other. As you can see, we can affect it with this variable. Let's come back and replace that variable by something that will always give out the right separation. What we actually need to do is take a resolution, take away one from it, and then divide it by two. And then the answer to that will actually give us always the right separation. Okay, it's working. Everything is still intact. Wonderful. Let's uh, do the last thing we need to do before we wrap up this script. And it's actually defining one more variable. We need to define the vertice number per section. To do that, we need to go back to the end of the loop and uh, take the total number of vertices that we hold and divide by the number of faces. It's important to take the default vertices because only this array will contain all of them. I'm not actually going to transform the cube into a sphere here just yet, even though it will take one extra node. We just need to normalize the vector before multiplying by the radius and then it will be done. But I will not, I will not do it now. I will do it later after we, uh, after we assemble the update function. Let's proceed to creating the remaining functions we will need for this script. It's the update function and the cycle noise function. Uh, we will not write anything in them uh, for now. Uh, we'll go into the event graph and actually make sure that every tick the update function is called so that it's updating the sphere every frame. Actually, it's important to realize that you actually don't need an update function. You can copy what you've made in the constructor and and make it a function and call that every time you make a change. But I find that this uh, method is pretty lazy and actually uses up a lot of processing power and that the frame rate gets pretty low. So I want to make uh, a lightweight version of it. And uh, based on my estimates, uh, it increased the refresh rate of updating uh, by 30, 35%. Let's start by cutting off things we will no longer need. Clearing the vertices default goes because they are fixed now. Redefining vertices per section goes. We need to recreate the index and replace the old ones by it so that the script does not complain. We no longer need to recreate the grids as they already exist, so that goes. We will not use that loop to cycle through the needed vertices, instead we will use a different loop. So if you have been following, you know that the vertices default holds all the vertices of our mesh in order, so it will hold all six faces. So the first six will have be the first phase, the second six will be the second one, and so on. And we can use the index to access each slice in order from one from the first one to the sixth one. I'm not going to explain this further, this math makes sense. Now all that code that we used to define the correct vector to get to the default position goes because its result is already stored in the vertices default array. So all that the loop body is going to do is get the vector from the array, put it through a cycle noise function, and then add it back to the vertex array, which is currently empty and waiting for new variables. But our cycle noise function does not have any inputs or outputs yet, so let's quickly 
So let's create uh, a vector input and a vector output for it. And the output will be added to the vertices, as I was saying. Finally, we don't need to set the material anymore because it's already there. Uh, let's replace that index I forgot to replace and create the mesh section again. Actually, if you read the description of that function, it will say creates or replaces the particular section. So based on that index we're giving it, it will actually rewrite the old section. And let's clear the vertex array so that the next loop can have a clean one to work with. It's time to come back into our constructor and add that normalization I was talking about right before the multiplication by the radius, not after, before we need to normalize the vector and that will force every point to be exactly one unit away from the center. Yes, indeed it worked. We have our sphere. So far, if you were to switch it on, the sphere would disappear because our update function is feeding it back, feeding back null vectors. To fix that, we need to code our last function. I'm going to remind you that I'm planning to implement this cos function by making up a plane that will move up and down the sphere and based on the distance to that plane, the vertices will have a different displacement. So what we need to code is the movement of that axis before we update, before we call that noise. So let's say that the axis will start at minus one, go all the way to one, and that's when it's gonna be teleported back to minus one. So I'm coding the following logic. As long as axis position is not one, it will incrementally add the particular incremental value to that position. And when it is equal or bigger than one, it will return the axis position back to minus one. All along, we're updating the sphere. Let's go to our last destination, the cycle nose function, and let's give it a couple of parameters. I gave it the speed parameter, which was actually unnecessary. I have no clue why I did that, but it will still remain there because I'm lazy to re record. The effect minus, which is actually going to be the strength of the negative cos effect. So if you choose one, it will go down nothing. If you choose 0 0.9, it will go down maximum 10%. Effect plus is similar, but in the positive direction and position uh, remains the same, but I will split it into the basic component. So we're gonna be changing the display of points uh, from the center outwards into the space. So we're gonna get a vector from the center to our point. In order to do that, we're gonna do the current position that we're feeding into the noise function minus the uh, position of the whole mesh. Now, this value will be, need to be multiplied by some variable and the result will uh, define if the uh, outputting vertices will be lower than the initial position or higher than the initial position. Now, how do we calculate that? We need to multiply the x position by the radius because uh, currently axis position rotates uh, between minus one and one. And if the radius is not equal to one, that will cause problems. Here, if we take away the z value of each uh, vertex position from, uh, from that axis, we will get the distance to that axis. And let's take an absolute value so we make sure that the distance is always positive. Now I'm going to use a clamp function. So the minimum distance between the points, the, between, the, between the axis and the point will be zero. What's the maximum? Well, if the point stop position will be one and our lowest point is minus one, uh, not taking account the radius yet, then the biggest difference is two. Uh, we will multiply two by the radius. So again, it takes account the radius and put it into the input range B. What well, is it going to be our output range B? So we actually want to output that into a cost function and the cost function will accept values between 0 and 2 pi, which is 360 degrees. Now we'll pass it the result into the cost function and we'll get an output. And we know that the result of a cost function can be between minus one and one. So we wanna map it into something more relatable to our cause here. So what are we gonna map it into? Let's map it into effect plus and effect minus. That way we're gonna get a displacement inside this range. That's what we wanted to define by adding this to the function in the first place. All that remains is to connect that to the multiply and the output. Now let's find the cycle noise in the update function and fill those newly created inputs with something. I will give it uh, 001, if well, that's insignificant since we didn't use it and uh, clamp it between 0 0.9 and 1.1. You can actually see that cost function. If you look at the top of the, of the mesh, if you look at the top of the sphere moving, you can actually see that cost function moving, tra traversing the thing. As you remember, I, I reduced, I removed Z from the axis position. If you were to remove Y or X, you will actually get the other axis. And at this point I did a, this is a stupid thing. I was like, let me make a logical circuit so that I can handle all those possibilities. And I did. And it's ridiculous, but it works. 
Uh, so I'm not gonna go through it, but it's all gonna be in the comment section. But all it does is that if you choose more than one axis, it will do nothing. And if you choose one particular axis, it will do that one. And if you choose none of them, it will do none of them. And uh, the sphere will just inflate and deflate, inflate and deflate. Thank you for watching. Um, this has been a lot. This has been a lot to record and a lot to edit. I need to make videos smaller. For the next time, next week, I'm gonna be uh, showing you what I did with a... Uh... Ooh, here he goes, boy. Geodesic Octoedron. Yeah, good enough. I'm gonna be procedurally generating that one. But it's way more complicated because you don't have a plugin to make the initial grid, so you have to do it by yourself. But it was really... It was really a challenge to figure out all the vertices, interactions, and all the triangles. So I hope you like this. Let me know what I can improve. So far I'm kind of jumping between showing you how it looks satisfying and nice and artistic uh, and explaining you tutorial-wise how to make it. So tell me what do you prefer. Would you still like them in the same video, in different videos, uh, or maybe mixed differently? Let me know. Any constructive feedback is welcome.